Hello, and welcome to the Pharmacist Academy, where I use images and animations to teach you medical, pharmacy, nursing related topics. In this video, I will provide you with the best explanation of the autonomic nervous system and its role in pharmacology. Watch the video till the end, and if you feel like I did a good job presenting the topic, then hit the like button. Thank you. Let's start with the nervous system. The nervous system is your body's command center. It originates from the brain and it controls everything. Your movements, thoughts, memory, feelings, sleep, aging, heartbeat, digestion, I mean everything, you name it. It's even responsible for the automatic responses that you give to the world around you. I mean, the list is endless. For a system like this to control everything in the body and how you experience the environment, can you imagine how complex it must be? Extremely complex. But the nervous system uses specialized cells called neurons to make the system a little bit less complicated. Neurons send and receive signals and messages all over the body. These signals and messages help you do everything. So your tongue can taste something and communicate it directly to the brain through neurons. The nervous system is divided into two main parts the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord. The spinal cord is simply a nerve tissue that extends from the brain down to the lower back. The peripheral nervous system is divided into two parts. First is the somatic nervous system, which is a component of the peripheral nervous system associated with the voluntary control of the body movements by the use of skeletal muscles. It is responsible for all the functions we are aware of and can consciously influence, including the movement of our arms, legs, and other parts of our body. The second part of the peripheral nervous system and also the focus of this video is the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system controls involuntary physiologic processes, things that occur in your body without a conscious effort. Example, blood pressure, breathing, digestion, sexual arousal. The autonomic nervous system is divided into three. The sympathetic nervous system activity increases in times of need, especially times of stress or danger. So it's normally active in the body to maintain homeostasis, but then it increases as needed. This system is responsible for your body's fight or flight response. The parasympathetic nervous system activity increases during times when the body needs to relax, maintain the body's daily function, recover, and conserve energy to be used later. Next is the enteric nervous system. This is the largest division of the autonomic nervous system. So have you ever heard somebody say, oh, just go with your guts to make a decision? Or you feel like you have butterflies in your stomach when you're nervous? You're likely getting signals from an unexpected source, your second brain, aka the enteric nervous system. This system consists of over 100 million neurons that governs the function of the GI eye tracts. In this video, we will focus mainly on the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So we now have a general idea of what these two systems do. Let's dive a little bit deeper and see how these systems actually do their jobs. First, let's get a visual understanding of the anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So we know that the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system are part of the autonomic nervous system, which is part of the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, as mentioned before, serve as the communication pathway between the CNS and the rest of the body. And it consists of the nerves that branch out mainly from the spinal cord, but also the brain. The spinal cord is a tissue, and this tissue is surrounded by bones to protect it. The bones surrounding it is what we sometimes refer to as backbones, aka the vertebral column or spinal column. The backbone contains 33 individual bones. These bones are also grouped into regions depending on its location. So the top part in the blue is the cervical region, and then the thoracic region, the lumbar, sacrum, and the coccyx. In each region, there are a specific number of individual backbones. In the cervical region, there are seven, 
and it's numbered as C1 to C7. So C1 will be at the top and then you number it down. In the thoracic, it's 12. Sacrum 5 that's fused together and coccyx 4 that's fused together. The sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system originate from specific regions of the spinal cord. The sympathetic nervous system originates from the thoracic and lumbar region, aka the thoracolumbar. The parasympathetic nervous system originates from the cranium and sacral region. Remember that the brain is also part of the autonomic nervous system, so it's not just the spine. Now, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves emerging from the spinal cord. Each pair of spinal nerve corresponds to a region of the spinal cord and they are named accordingly. So there are eight pairs of cervical nerves, 12 thoracic nerves, five lumbar nerves, five sacral nerves, and one coccygeal nerve. These spinal nerves are the ones responsible for the signals and communications between the CNS and the rest of the body. So let's learn more about them. If you zoom into this spinal vertebrae, you will see something like this. I tried my best to find a good picture to help you visualize this. So in this picture, we have the spinal cord here with the vertebrae bone surrounding it. We have two vertebrae here separated by the intervertebral disc which provides cushioning to the spinal column. And finally, the spinal nerve pair, so one on each side. If we zoom in further, we will see something like this. I know it's a lot going on here, but just bear with me. First, this is the spinal nerve. Of course, since it's a pair of spinal nerves, the one on the left is also a spinal nerve. As you can see, the spinal nerve divides into two at the spinal cord. One part contains efferents, neurons, which carry stimuli away from the CNS towards the target structures. This part is called the ventral roots or the motor neuron. And there is the dorsal roots, this contains afferent neurons, which return sensory information from the body to the CNS. It's also known as a sensory neuron. So each spinal nerve contains both types of these neurons. By the way, I have a short video on afferent versus efferent. I'm going to include the link right above for you to check it out. Now I'm going to show you in a simplistic way of how the spinal nerves leave the spinal cord area and interact with other neurons and then the target organ. This will vary for the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. Let's begin with the sympathetic. Here is the picture showing you the pair of spinal nerves innervating the spinal cord. Let's assume that there's a black line here is a neuron, specifically a preganglionic neuron, or you can call it before the ganglion neuron. The ganglion or ganglia are a cluster of nerve cell bodies. They receive chemical messages from the preganglionic neurons and then the postganglionic neurons will then interact with the target organ and lead to an effect. The parasympathetic division is very similar since it also communicates by preganglionic neurons, releasing chemical messages in the ganglia for the postganglionic neurons to pick up this message and then communicate it back to the target organs. Note that depending on which organ or location the message is for, the location and the type of ganglia may be different, but the concept will still follow. Preganglionic to ganglia, then the postganglionic to the organs. That also applies to the cranial nerves coming from the brain as part of the parasympathetic nervous system. The reason why the sympathetic nervous system has a shorter preganglionic neurons and a longer postganglionic neurons, and the parasympathetic is the total opposite of this is because the ganglia for the sympathetic nervous system are closer to the spinal cord. So as soon as the preganglionic comes out of the spinal cord, boom, the ganglia is right there. But then the postganglia neurons have a longer distance to go before they reach the target organ. And this is why they're much longer. For the parasympathetic nervous system, the ganglia is further out. So the preganglionic neurons are long in order to reach that ganglia. After that, there is a short distance to travel to the target organ and that's why the postganglionic neurons are shorter. So now we can get a closer look and see which chemical messengers are being utilized to communicate between these neurons. If you think I'm doing a good job explaining the topic so far, 
please hit the like button so that the YouTube algorithm can show this video to more people so they can also benefit. Thank you. The preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system both release acetylcholine as the chemical messengers in the ganglia. This acetylcholine binds to nicotinic receptors on the postganglionic neurons. The postganglionic neurons for the sympathetic nervous system releases noradrenaline or norepinephrine, which will bind to the adrenergic receptors on the target organ. The postganglionic neurons of the parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine, which binds to the muscarinic receptors of the target organ, and it leads to an effect. Before we discuss some of the organ-specific effects of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, I wanted to show you an image that depicts all we've discussed so far to help you visualize this. I'm very sorry if the picture is not that clear or hard to see these things. I will include the link of the picture in the description in case you want to take a look at it. All I wanted to show you is, you know, just think about everything that we've learned so far. That is what this image is demonstrating in its simplest form. We have the spinal cord with different regions. I mentioned how depending on whether it's the parasympathetic nervous system or the sympathetic nervous system, the nerves will come out from different regions and then to a ganglia and then to the target organ. Now we can learn about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system effect on specific organs. We will follow this format where I list the organ and then inform you of the sympathetic nervous system effect plus the specific type of adrenergic receptor associated with that organ. Then I'll do the same for the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is known for fight or flight. So it kicks in under stressful, dangerous conditions and when you're active. While the parasympathetic nervous system is known for the rest and digest and it promotes relaxation, recovery, and energy conservation. When these neurotransmitters interact with the specific target organ, they do it as agonists. For the sympathetic nervous system in the eye, we get madriasis or pupil dilation to help you see clearer in a stressful or dangerous situation. This is achieved with the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. For the parasympathetic, we get meiosis or constriction of the pupil. This is achieved with the muscarinic 1 receptor. The sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system also controls the salivary glands. The sympathetic nervous system decreases the production of saliva by stimulating the M3 receptor, while the parasympathetic nervous system increases production of saliva by stimulating the M2 and M3 receptors. In the heart, there is an increase in the heart rate for the sympathetic nervous system due to beta-1 stimulation and a decrease in the heart rate for the parasympathetic due to M2 stimulation. In the blood vessels, the sympathetic nervous system causes vasoconstriction due to alpha-1 stimulation. In the parasympathetic, there is vasodilation due to M3 receptor stimulation. Next is the lungs. Stimulation of the sympathetic beta-2 receptors lead to bronchodilation. When you're in danger and let's say running from something, you would want your airways to open up so you can get better oxygenation. For the parasympathetic, we get bronchial constriction from stimulating the M2 and M3 receptors. In the GI tract, peristalsis, which is an involuntary muscle movement, helps things move through the GI tract. And this decreases in the sympathetic nervous system with alpha-1, beta-2 stimulation. In the parasympathetic nervous system, this increases because it's rest and digest. This is achieved with the M2, M3 receptor stimulation. Finally, in the bladder, there is bladder relaxation, which will lead to urinary retention. And this is achieved with the beta-2 receptors. For the parasympathetic, it's opposite as it stimulates the M3 receptors lead into bladder contraction. Make sure to turn on your bell notification so you get the alerts for the next video where I'll be discussing different medications on the markets that target different parts of the autonomic nervous system. These agents can be agonist or antagonist and we use them in our daily clinical practice. That would be the end of this video. I hope you learned a thing or two and I hope I was able to give you a good introduction to the autonomic nervous system. If you like the video, please hit the like button, subscribe and leave a comment down below and follow me on my social media platforms. Thank you for watching this video and take care.